Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast with Daryl Morey and Jimmy Iovine, brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor. The easiest way to shop for the best tickets thanks to their revolutionary grading system. Buy and sell tickets in just two taps on your phone. Everything fully guaranteed. Right now, my listeners get $10 off baseball tickets. The first time they use SeatGeek, use promo code BSMLB. Download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek.com. We are also brought to you by Miller Lite. One of the original sponsors of The Ringer. Miller Lite is brewed to not only taste great, but to also be less filling. It only has 96 calories and won't fill you up. It's brewed to be enjoyed from tip-off to final buzzer. It's the original light beer and has been since they first showed up courtside in 1975. Miller Lite, my favorite beer since the late 1980s. That is a 100% of a fact. Also, we're brought to you by Binge Mode Game of Thrones. Season 5 up right now. They're almost done. We'll see if Mallory Rubin makes it, but they have five in the book, 50 episodes if you want to relive Game of Thrones. And then finally, Joe House's new podcast, House of Carbs, launches this week. It is available right now. You can subscribe to it on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, House of Carbs, the greatest art we've ever done for a podcast. I am so jealous. Uh, Coming up right now, Rockets GM, Daryl Morey, but first Pearl Jam. Okay, we are taping this 10.30, uh, Monday morning, July 3rd. So if anything crazy happens over the next few hours, uh, don't blame us because Daryl Morey is here. Hi, Daryl. Thanks for having me on. Rockets GM. You haven't been on in a while. Yeah, I think last time I got fined like 100, 100 grand or something, so I'm <laughs> trying to avoid that this time. <laughs> uh, you landed Chris Paul. He's a very famous basketball player who plays well. We we are very excited about that. Have you met him? Have you hung out with him? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So he's he's been in L.A. and came to our uh, Iguodala meeting and he came to the Iguodala meeting. Oh, he's yeah. recruiting. Oh man! So that was a big reason we were excited to get the trade done early because we go into free agent with more tools, trade you know trade exception, you know biannual full mid level and Chris Paul at meeting. So it was pretty good. That's amazing. So. To get so you do that trade early, you get Chris Paul. You give up two, a couple of really good assets. Lou Williams on a great contract, Beverly, who everybody was trying to get last February, good contract. Sam Decker, young wing guy, give up a pick. Montrose but the benefit Harrell. is and Mont- and Harrell, who yeah. I'm still mad the Celtics didn't take. But um, so you get Chris they Paul. That. They were going to take him. They, they... I think we had like seven chances to take him. We just oh, kept okay. not taking him. He just went one one yeah. pick earlier. Yeah, yeah, you took him. So Chris Paul comes in. But then, because you do the trade early, you create this exception that enables you to get PJ Tucker. PJ Tucker also the exception allowed us to, you know, go for Iguodala and guys like that. And uh, obviously, that didn't work out. But we did get a bunch of guys paid around the league with our yeah, nice. trade exception so far. But we'll we'll hold on to that through the season. And I think teams try too much to just make everything perfect right in July. You know, like. You don't need your best team on July 4th. You need your best team in April 15th. So I like to keep some powder dry. We're probably going to keep our biannual, keep our trade exception alive through the year. And then if we take an injury or something's not working, we can make a move. I'm glad you said that because it does seem like a lot of teams try to finish their team in July, August, and September. And especially if you have a good team, and we've seen it the last couple of years, January, February, these minimum buyout guys are available. And if you're a good team, you have an amazing chance of getting them. Yeah, no, I I think a lot of times teams, you know, they want to finish July 4th and then off to the Cape or Jersey Shore or, or uh, San Diego. So who who knows? But um, I do think it's, it's definitely smart to stay flexible. I think one of the, what happens to teams, especially if they get two stars or I hope someday maybe we'll, we'll have a, a third guy to add. They get locked in, you know, because they, you know, they they have their picks encumbered through 2080, you yeah. know, no seconds, and and so we have, we have all our first 19 going forward, most of our seconds, and a bunch of international players that we think can help. So, 
staying flexible and and be good. That's sort of our theme. Sergio Lowe. What is he like? Forty five now. <laughs> MVP. Best guy. Best guy MVP in the Euro League. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know what? It, it it turns out like I. I think, think he's my age now. <laughs> I think I want to play in Madrid because Madrid must be awesome. It must he, be incredible. Uh, He's turned down. He's turned down some deals. I cannot believe and uh, the deals you offered him. We yeah. We pretty much talk every year. We flirt with each other every year. And uh, I actually do think he's going to play for us. Uh, it's it you know maybe on the back end, but you know he's maybe one of the best guards ever in Europe. So if he came in right now, is he immediately like a third guard? If he came in now, he would be he'd be an impact at least guy for a quality you, right? rotation player in the NBA, if not better. Well, maybe your owner needs to start stepping it up a little bit. Maybe he needs to fly out there to Madrid and take the guy out to dinner. We, we, you know, Coach McHale and I did that, and uh, I thought Didn't that work. was year we're going to get him. Um, it's not an ownership thing, you know, unless, you know, we only have the tools we have. You know, like unless, unless you're pro Karav, you don't have any way to, <laughs> Boats way and, to yeah. do some other Wait, things. so his life is so great in Madrid that – you now have this team that has a chance to win the NBA title potentially. He could come over here. He could make, I'm guessing, as much money as he makes there and try to play on, you know, in the best league on one of the best teams. And that's just not attractive. It's attractive, but I think uh, I'm just telling you, Madrid must be awesome and he God. wins MVPs he must be and single. titles. Uh, I think he's just about to get married or yeah, I think he's, I think he's getting married soon. You should, every week you should email him. <laughs> hey, it's Daryl. How are you? I think I tweet at him, you know, <laughs> I pine for him on Twitter. So, um, you have, you've hit almost rock bottom twice as a GM and both times rallied out of it in an amazing way. The first time you stockpiled all those picks that year. The year you ended up getting James Harden, you were so ready to make a move, all these things, you're trying to trade with everybody, nothing's happening. You go through the summer of 2012 and you just end up with these three picks. They were like 12, 16 and 18. None of them were impact guys. And now you're looking at this going, crap, what am I going to do? And then the James Harden One trade of those Rice falls. White, you know. Rice, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rice White who barely played. Um, MVP Jeremy of Canada. Lamb. MVP of Canada. Series, Jeremy so. Lamb, Terrence Jones. Yep. And you just, you have all these small pieces. You can't turn them into anything. You have all these attract, you have the attractive, uh, what was the pick you traded for Kyle Lowry? That yeah, was, it was the, uh, uh, inverse protected Toronto pick. Right. Yeah. So you have that. You have some expirings. The Chris Paul trade falls through. You were going to get Gasol on that trade, right? Correct. Yep. That falls through. Correct. Now you got nothing. James Harden comes in. Now all of a sudden, you're a genius again. Then last year, um, terrible Harden Howard, bad chemistry. Everybody's like, oh my God, this is it. Rebound, D'Antoni comes in. Now you got Chris Paul and James Harden Ryan in the Anderson, same thing. Eric Gordon, yeah, had a big, big part big of that. Big thing. Yeah, good times. Were you how worried were you? What what time were you more worried? The first time or the second time? I would say you missed one rock bottom, which was in 09, where we I thought we had maybe our title team and uh you know, we had our test, Tracy, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Prime, Shane. That was a competitive Lowry. rock bottom though. Yeah, well then, you know, through the season we lost McGrady, we lost Yao in the playoffs, and we still took the Lakers to seven who went on to win the title. Uh, but that was when we pretty much thought Yao Ming might be done. We knew Tracy McGrady was probably done and um, you know, we don't we don't do the rebuilding thing. Our worst, you know, both rock bottoms you mentioned that we've been at have been 41 at least win yeah. seasons. Um, but, you know, in many ways, as you know, that can be worse, right? Because, you know, you're not, you know, you don't have a high pick coming. So it's For almost you, even... it's the worst. You're in no man's land. <laughs> oh, I know. I, you're going you know, crazy. It's actually all the, all my analytics friends during that period were just killing me because they're like, what's the worst lottery pick to have? 14 and you yeah. got we got it like four straight years <laughs> like, i was losing my my nerd cred man it was yeah. really it was tough yeah um and you know but you know we had to fight through it and uh, i would say i would say two years ago might have been worse where you know we thought you know we may just made the western conference finals and then we only won half our games the next year i think that was definitely worse and and 
you know, from our owner, Leslie Alexander, to me, to, you know, the James Harden, to everyone, we were like, that shit's not happening again. We're we're going to pull out of this. And we took some heat even for signing Ryan, signing Eric Gordon, uh, obviously adding Coach D'Antoni. I think most people thought that was not a mistake. You know, our owner was instrumental in that. He always, always was excited how Mike's teams played. And he yeah. really, really wanted to uh, to look at him hard and actually got mad at me that I didn't sign him immediately. Right, I remember but, that. But I was doing my diligence. Mike's still mad at me for this, but I was doing my diligence. You know, we were sort of looking either at Mike or maybe more of a Brad Stevens type profile, a young up and comer. And I was doing my diligence on the latter. We knew Mike was the guy we wanted if we went veteran. And, you know, it's really, you know, it's been exciting. Just And we wanted to get back to being a uh, destination in free agency. You know, that year really hurt us for the premier free agent who happens to be on the best team in the league now. Because <laughs> I think if either this year or the two years ago happened, you know, we have a real shot at, at him uh, coming to Houston. But, you know, our timing was off Al there. Horford? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, these are things I can't say, but you yeah, can say. Okay. So, yeah. um, but you know, we really, uh, you know, we and 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 the plan really worked. You know, we got ourselves back to contention, and 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 that obviously led, you know, ultimately to having a great season, uh, and then Chris Paul coming here. Did you start to worry at some point, like some of the stuff you were doing, oh six, oh seven, oh eight? Which is a great time to be a GM, especially if you were using advanced metrics and not a lot was, of other people great, were. It was a great time. And yeah. as the league starts to evolve, now everybody's looking at the same data you're looking at. And everybody's trying to steal little tricks that you and some other teams are doing. And then by 2013, 14, there weren't a lot of old school teams anymore. Everybody was new school. Did you worry like oh like it was, this happened to Billy Bean a little bit in baseball right yeah, where he had yeah. an advantage and then all of a sudden it wasn't an advantage anymore? It, it, it's a real problem. I mentioned this in the you know in the Michael Lewis piece that our draft it happened again this year. It was very frustrating because we were picking in the forties. Yeah, I would say almost always in the forties we end up with a guy like twenty three to twenty six on our board and we go like that that's not bad like that's a late yeah. first quality which can be good. I mean, this year again, man, it, it was like straight down our board. And I'm not saying our board is great, but it's like we, we obviously have a lot of pride in it. We've, you know, I think by our analysis, we're like the fourth best drafting team over the last 11 years. Um, so, but yeah, the draft's more efficient. You know, free agency, you, you even see it here. Get, teams are being smarter about doing shorter deals and yeah. and things like that. That's sort of frozen up the market relative to the past. Um, yeah, you know, teams tanking is really smart. I mean, like it, it, we've never done it, but it, if you're going to be out of it and you can't compete with Golden State, you should be looking hard at what Philly did. Cause you know, like they're sitting there with like multiple first round picks, multiple. Ever. So, um, I think teams are just getting, they may not go extreme, extreme hinky, but they're being smarter about how they use their cap space. And yeah, it's, it's just yeah, it's harder, but hey, it that's was the funny job. knowing you, d knowing you during the Philly process thing because Hinky was your dude. I was like the only guy this, defending him. <laughs> you loved it, but this, you had always said this to me that this was if you had no hope, this was the strategy is just mm -hmm. to go completely hopeless. Yeah, and I try mean, to try to lose for three straight years and stockpile lottery picks. I mean, the Houston Astros are benefiting now. Jeff Luno did an amazing job with that, and uh, you know, I wish the Cubs uh, did it too. Cubs did it. You know, Theo's obviously one of the best, best out there. You know, you know, when we hit that rock bottom after, you know, we lost Yao Ming and Tracy had a conversation with our owner, really showed him like the two paths. And, you know, the, the, the Philly path is more reliable. Like you, you know, you can get a high pick by just sucking. Right. Yeah. So, and that's why people hate it yeah. because it's, you know, it's simple. Like, oh, everyone can suck. There's a thousand ways to be terrible. And uh, Jeff Van Gundy makes the best points on that. But it is more reliable way to get back into contention. But there is the other path, which is the one we took, which is, yeah, you have to just be very careful on your contracts, make sure everything is set up so that those players who are helping you have future options, you stockpile picks, and then you got to pounce with a trade. But, you, you know, you can wait a long time for a team to, you know, trade a guy like James Harden. That, that, that could take very long, whereas if you go the tank route, you might be three or four years and you're already a couple high picks into into the whole thing and it's much more reliable and probably quicker well you need some luck too i mean you all of it. honestly could have just ended up with Pau gasol and 
then Harden comes on the board and you don't have a chance to get him. That, people say that, but like Pow, if we had gotten him, no, was, Pow was really good. Well, I think he was very good, and I still think we could have done the James trade. People say we couldn't, and obviously I can't know what's in Sam Presti's head, so maybe it wouldn't have worked. Yeah, but the reality is, like we were. You know, it was going to be basically Scola and Kevin Martin for Pau Gasol. And, you know, we would have still had the same other pieces in the trade except Kevin Martin. And we could have, you know, if we wanted to piece that trade together, we could have always have traded Pau for Kevin Martin and really pieced it together that way. Yeah, so, interesting. So I don't I don't think that that couldn't have happened. But, yeah, yeah, you need a you need a they're still only letting one team win out of 30. So you need a lot of luck, either your picks that are high have to be have to pan out or you have to be able to pounce when a trade comes at some point because you're probably you're generally not signing a star it's really rare we've happened to do it twice with Dwight and and now Chris uh well Chris was a trade but it was sort of yeah. one of those ones that you know because he could leave was like like Lou and LeBron and uh Bosch went to Miami those were technically trades but obviously they were free agency so when did uh, you feel like big guys started to become less impactful as I cannot contend unless I have a star center. I would say my thinking's have evolved there in the last maybe three years. Um, yeah. Cause I, I love big guys. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I like, do too. I mean, you know, like I, you know, I'm not that I'm not tall. Obviously I wasn't a pro player. I was a pretty good high school player and I, but I played inside at six, four. Cause I was at a pathetic small high school in, in right. Ohio. Um, so at six, four, I was actually moderately big. I played it so you know every you know like every GM like has their soft spot for players. I have a soft spot for big guys who who play tough. You know like PJ Tucker. I got a soft spot for a guy like that who's big, bang, Chuck Hayes. You know yeah. even Dwight Howard. I love I love you know I love guys who play big, strong, and tough. And it's been tough for me to realize that 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 role is fading. And really, the modern NBA center is a guy like Clint Capella. You know mobile. Fast screen rim rollers. protector, screen roller, yeah. lob dunker. That that really is the modern the modern five, and so everyone that, else has got to be able to shoot and defend. If that's true, then how does Nerlens only go for like thirty cents on the dollar at the trade deadline last year? Yeah, he's about to be a free agent, and uh, but there's five versions of him in the entire league, probably. Um, maybe a few more than that. Maybe I mean, eight? I think everyone keeps getting pushed to the five, so a lot of the. A lot of the athletic fours are now fives. So I, there, I think there's more. I'd, I'd have to count and look. But so I do think, you think like somebody like Jonathan Isaac could eventually be a stretch five with the way teams are playing basketball now? Yeah, absolutely. No, yeah, no doubt. Yeah. That's, he was the most intriguing. That, are you allowed to we talk were... to other pro- about other prospects or no? Because I thought like he was the most intriguing of the top six for like just – I don't know what position he is, but where basketball is going, he might be a center. I don't know. I'll just talk generally about it because we yeah. talked a lot about actually shooting fives. Yeah. Like that's like if you a rim protecting, rebounding guy who can shoot threes, that's going to be there's And there's a few unicorns like that in the league now. That's going to be the the super unique asset that like maybe no one, no one will have. So. That's why I was losing my mind when it seemed like, uh, your friend Phil Jackson for two seconds might actually trade Porzingis because I was like, there's three guys in the league like this. Two of them are on the Warriors, and now and now here's Porzingis, a rim protector. I think Philly, Philly has one too. I think potentially. Yeah, if he can stay in the court. Yeah, a rim protector who can shoot threes on the other end is like that's the hardest thing to find, and you've you've struck oil if you have that. You cannot trade Porzingis. Yeah, so I, I think they I think they wise wisened up. Yeah, I think uh, it's it's a very unique skill, but you're gonna see it because like literally you go to the playground. Yeah, every everybody's... single kid is shooting threes. They're all messing up their yeah. shot for later because they're trying to hoist NBA threes at age six or whatever. Right. Um, you know, and that's why you know. But all the bigs are handling the ball. All the bigs are face up. All the bigs are trying to shoot threes. So there's gonna be uh, like. There's going to be a, a, a bumper crop coming. I don't know when, but it's coming. Yeah, I wonder, like, so you think, like, the guys that we grew up with, um, like Brad Doherty. Love Brad. One what, of my, like, one of your favorites. Your team was favorites. the Cavs growing up. A lot of people don't know that. But, like, Brad Doherty now, time machine Brad Doherty, is is shooting threes from, like, age 10. For sure, right? And yeah. I don't know if he even has a jump hook. 
<laughs> no, no, I, I have a jump hook. That's like yeah, no one yeah, has a jump hook. Right. I love my jump, jump hook. Out. I'm like in my old man game where I'm terrible. I, uh, I'm, I'm like I, I, you know, that's that, you know, that's like we like Mo, Modi Yunus had a jump hook. He was like everyone was like, wow, yeah, jump hook. Guys, a jump Look hook. at that it's thing. Both hands, left and right. You know, so the, um, uh, but like Brad Doherty, he does. He's not developing his game like that. Ewing, yeah. I think. Had to have been a center no matter what, because just the size and athleticism of him. I can't imagine him shooting. I don't three. know. I mean, Who knows yeah, though? All the Mel, all the Memphis center shooting threes. I mean, like you know. Hold on, we could take a quick break. To talk about our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Sounds great. Remember, remember uh, Dan I've Gilbert, heard of that. Cavs <laughs> owner. Uh, they understand that home plays a big role in your life and family. That's why they created Rocket Mortgage, which gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple and allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you, whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th. With Rocket Mortgage, you get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision, like how Daryl Morey loves to make informed decisions. I'm, I'm looking at a condo. Can they help me with a condo yeah, maybe mortgage? They, I'm, you should ask them. <laughs> Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button, get a real mortgage approval in minutes, adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you're getting the right solution for you. That's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Bill Simmons, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. If I use them, will Dan get more money to use on the calves? That I don't. I don't know the answer to that. Maybe. <laughs> have to be careful. He, he's that. already spending. He doesn't. He doesn't need more money. That's he's true. spending on everybody. Yeah, he's, he he's, just paid Kyle Corver. And... He's he's going to be paying all his you know other owners a lot in luxury tax. So. Wait, we have. I have to ask you a couple of things here that uh, I cannot get answers for. One, 2016, the big the big cap spending spree of 2016. The cap's up. Oh my God! Everybody has so much money to spend. This is amazing. The cap's going to keep going up and up. Here, everybody, take some money. And now this year, the cap went backwards. So you're looking at this. I understand the reasons why the cap jumped last year. It went up like, what, right. 25 TV million deal. or yeah. 21 million, new yeah. media rights, all that stuff. Goes up to 100 million? 100. Yeah. yeah, I think, well, yeah, 100. And then, so uh, then they thought this year it was going to go to like 109, 110, right. which was part of when everybody's spending money last year. They're thinking, well, it's going to go up another 10 this year. It goes backwards. And now you have all these teams that are screwed and it's and it, it, it's kind of chaos. Why didn't people know this was going to happen last year? What were the dynamics? Well, the NBA guidance was up. Like NBA guidance was, was going to go up, I think, $9 million originally. So teams were sort of relying on that. And then... So the NBA was just wrong? Well, some of it's very hard for the NBA to forecast. Look, for example, Cleveland and Golden State mowing through the playoffs. You know, Golden State bangs out like... Seven to ten million per playoff game. So the fact that we lost like probably eight to ten playoff games, it hurt. Yeah, the, it knocked the cap a, down like four or five million. It was a big factor in the cap going down. So well, I know uh, my I know Mike Zarin on the Celtics was calculating every oh, game that was lost. He was, he was having yeah, a stroke. You we know, lost like, another four hundred thousand. Mike 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 was so threading the needle on their cap space. Like we were talking about one trade where they get one pick. Like, I forget, one that was like 15 to 17 or whatever. And then I was like, would you do the deal if I get you the 18th pick? He was like, no, that'll that'll mess up my cap by 50 grand. <laughs> so right. I was like, man, Mike, you, you're you on top of this. So Jesus. Was, yeah. So, um, and then the other thing was they made that pension deal with the ex-players, right? With the retired players. And I did. think some yeah. of that knocked down the cap too because yeah, the players totally and the owner, with that, but I, I think, think that, that knocked it down it. by a couple million. Yeah, that but was... now it's somewhere at 99 and yeah, you but have... that, that was a good thing though I mean that, no, that's a great thing I talked to a lot of the retired NBA players and these guys built the league and the more money should have been coming to them so. well you had Moses died in Houston what six months ago uh, a lot about a year ago yeah, around about this year time ago. very sad tragically like right after yeah a, right after an event so. no the pension thing is fantastic I just don't think that I I'm just I guess I'm surprised this league that is so centered around competitiveness, looking for an edge. And yet now you have this crucial spending spree moment and the budget, the budgets are just like kind of arbitrary. It's like, ah, no, now you got 99 instead. And it's like these teams that are planning for five years, 
and there's $10 million less than that that they're planning with seems like a weird way to do business. Yeah, well, I, I think everyone was trying to work out a different solution to that, but just couldn't, you know, to, yeah. to, to be fair to the league and everybody. I'm not to, criticizing yeah, the league. It yeah. just seems like... It did create, and, and, it, and it it hurt because players now compare salaries yeah. and, and they don't understand how, you know this guy's getting this and that guy's getting that. And you have to just explain it was just random. They were free agent at this right. year instead of that year. And it's not just the cap jump. It's like randomly, are you a year where there's a lot of point guards? If you're a point guard, then you you end up getting less or, or randomly a year when there's either a scarcity or of wings. Like it, it, it's, there's no, the rationale, rationality of like who gets what in free agency is, it, it it's tough for agents and players because it's just like almost random at times and they it gets everyone frustrated and I have to deal with the repercussions which is like everyone like you know we like um, one of the players who just went to Philly got you know got like 23 million and Chris Paul is like I'm making 24 million right <laughs> like, and so so you know you get like random stuff like that where they just don't it's just hard for them to process you know so yeah it's it's almost like a video game yeah, it it the the reality is is not is not good. And so, do you part, think part of the reason we had our strategy last year getting getting Ryan and Eric on, uh, well, you know you know good deals for the team obviously took us to fifty five wins, uh, was in that market last year we were like let's get the premier guys quick pay a little more because we thought that the next tier down was going to be people paying like 10 to 15 million. And that's when you get in trouble. For guys who make like, should be making three to yeah. five at best. So, Well, it does seem like we're headed toward a reckoning next week where there's going to be too many free agents left and not enough money. A lot of money. agents fired. I yeah, mean, yeah. I've, I've heard, you know, I've heard players getting like 30 million wanting to fire their agents and stuff yeah. like that. I mean, like that's, I mean, that's insane, right? I mean, yeah. Like, but it is actually crazy. You know, like one of the big moments in my career um early on where i was like welcome to the job moment i think it was maybe two years in was when i offered a it was i think at the time a 137 million dollar max deal to chris bosh yeah and, and and it was like he was gonna go lie in his birdcage with the paper and i was like when well, you or i would be shaking if someone's like sliding you a 137 million dollar deal uh, and for him, obviously, he had many teams courting him, so it was just yet another 137 million. <laughs> like it was, it was a it was very eye opening. Yeah, me. but I remember talking to you. I was having lunch in East LA with my dad, and I ended up talking to you. And it was during the 90 minute window when you thought you had Chris Bosh, <laughs> yeah. and you were out of your mind. I was. You're like, oh my god, we're gonna we're gonna win the title next year. We, I'm gonna have James Harden, Chris Bosh, and Dwight Howard. And Dwight Howard, we. we I mean, going, I, nobody is going to be able to match up with us. I mean, obviously, you know, if that team had been healthy all year, I think we would have maybe had the best what team the, in the league. That was so. heading into 14-15, right? Yeah, I think. It See, fourteen fifteen. Yeah, that's like one of the great what if titles. Super team. Yeah, the Warriors were like, they were good, but they were yeah. still they hadn't really gone through the four rounds of playoff intensity the Spurs kind of Spurs were great obviously Miami was still great so well we would have we would have you would have been have in there injured Miami yeah that was the lost I mean really the Clippers that's when you look at the what ifs for the Clippers and the Josh Smith Corey Brewer game which is <laughs> is that the greatest sports moment of your life yeah I I for me no there's no doubt and I was so were you at that game I was technically at the game just but a I puddle? was catatonic <laughs> I was like, I mean, because J- J- James had been, you know, yeah, he was, he was on the funk. bench because he was, you know, uh, you know, Kevin was going to bring him back in, but the the, the group was rolling. So he rolled. Yeah, I remember. And so I'm, I, you know, honestly, this was a great moment for Coach McHale because, you know, I'm like in my head, like, what are we doing? Put right. James Harden back in the game. Like, you know, and I would be the worst coach ever. I'd be like, I, right. I'd be like, you know, Tom. To, you know, just just screaming at everyone. I'd be insane on the sidelines. No one would like me. Right. And and so you know, I, I appreciated Coach McHale at that moment. He pushed all the right buttons. And uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, Corey Brewer, Josh Smith, Terrence Jones hit a three in that stretch. I think I think we had uh, collective career twenty nine percent shooters make 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 about Corey seven Brewer's threes. Heat check. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, 
And uh, and then the Clippers missed 14 straight shots. And it helped. wasn't that we came back from 17 down. We then went up by like nine with like four minutes, yeah. to two minutes to go or something. Like it was, it was the. You're never going to talk about that game with Chris Paul, I'm guessing. You know, I actually, we haven't talked about yeah, it. Probably yeah, don't, don't bring that one up. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't part hey, of the recruiting Chris. pitch. Yeah. yeah. That, wasn't, that wasn't part of the recruiting pitch. Uh, actually, I, now, now you say it, I'm like, I actually would enjoy getting his perspective of that whole thing because it, it was just a weird, I've never had, I've been through a lot of tough times in my career and, you know, everyone's who's rooted for a team their whole life, whether it was the Cavaliers when I was growing up or the Indians yeah. or Browns especially, you have those moments where like, just the train wrecks coming and like, and it happened to the other team for right. me once. And like, yeah, it was weird for me. Cause like, I haven't had the other team be the, the one who's driving themselves off a cliff. So it was, you know, I've been to a, an amazing number of basketball games in my life. And that was the weirdest game I've ever been to ever. That's, I've never that's been a to a game. Right there. I've never seen a game like that in my life because I remember, and I was also thinking for you, just as your friend, like, you know, Harden comes out, he was terrible. And the his body language on the bench, and I'm thinking, like, this is bad. This is going to yeah. be a bad loss for them, and he's going to have to figure out, what do I do this summer? And it looked like you were going to lose by 30. Yeah. And then you started coming back without Harden, and he wasn't engaged initially, and then he got into it. And you could kind of feel it. And at the same time, the Clippers, you know, they had no bench that year. They had played that tough Spurs series. They had six tough games against you, and they just died. And it was like Blake died. It, it wasn't, I don't know if it was a choke or if it was dead legs, but it was, you could literally see them run out of gas and you, your guys are playing with so much energy and the crowd, the crowd was like catatonic. Yeah. I mean, it was it, like, but you might as well not have had people there. It was like in an empty gym. The thing that struck me that I, that only you could know, or if you're in LA was how much the town hates the Clippers. I couldn't, it was a, like, I had friends at the Dodgers game and when we were in Houston in game seven. Yeah. And I guess the, they told me, I don't know if this is true, that when it was announced at the Dodger game that we had beaten them in game seven, the crowd yeah. cheered. Like, that's tough, man. <laughs> like, I it's, mean. It's a really weird dynamic. And yeah. that was one of the reasons I wrote about I wrote a, a column about blowing up the Clippers on Friday. About that was a how, great column. Actually. Thank you. Yeah. Well, they ended up. They I love your back to writing, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, um, but one of the one of the reasons was that they had this this five month window of uh, sorry, my uh, my friend Jacoby keeps calling me. You're a popular guy. Um, they had this f five year window where the Lakers are a train wreck, and they have Chris Paul and Blake Griffin and DeAndre and Lob City, and it's like the Laker blood just runs so deep here and the Laker fans so hate deep. the Clippers and you feel it like at little moments like that Dodgers game where it's like the Clippers are supposed to be an LA team and yet they have this small group of fans that love them. They do have diehard then, fans. I've met a lot of and them. And then a ton of Laker Clipper fans. Clipper Daryl, man. Clipper Daryl. <laughs> and those people will come in whether they suck or not. So I get why he had to do the Blake thing. Like if I think it's really tough to rebuild. You can do it if you're in Philly. You can do it if you're in Oklahoma City. I don't know if you can do it here when there's 10 other teams. It, it's a big reason why in Houston we we never would choose. I think just the competitiveness. Well, you have, yeah, you have the well, there's Astros the competitiveness the of our owner. Yeah. There's the competitiveness of me, James Harden. Well, we didn't have James at the time, but yeah, we yeah. also had a great group of veterans, so it would have been hard to go the tank route anyway. But we also felt like Houston is a town where – Obviously, they're coming back to the Strohs now, which is great. But like for a while, the Strohs were like barely like that. You could get right. like you 500 people there. It felt like I'm happy they're really turning around. I think they're the best team in baseball. But we felt like if we ever went through that in Houston, it would just you know you might lose a whole generation of fans if you know if you're bad for three four years. So you know we 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 felt like we went the right way. I have some slight issues with your fans, but I'm not going to make what, you uncomfortable. What, what? I think the home court advantage could be a little better. Well, you're from Boston. So, I know. You I mean, know I'm used I to think... a certain level of, uh, I have a certain level of expectations for a home crowd performance. <laughs> I mean, our, if you're I, at I game know you're going to defensive. This is why I didn't bring it up. Yeah, yeah, you're right. If you, you're at game you seven against now. the Clippers, yeah, yeah. you would have seen our, our okay. fans come out. And, and right. we, we have great fans, but 
You, you've been in some of the all-time great fan cities in your life, so. Well, definitely the cold weather cities, it means more. Well, yeah, you got nothing to do. You got nothing to do. It's <laughs> cold. Like, it's cold all the time. I've lived in Boston for 10 years. Yeah. Like, you know, you got to be going to an arena. You're, you don't want to be freezing your ass off outside. Last thing, and then we're going to go, and we're going to... Uh, and we're going to tape some for the Ringer NBA show too that people can listen to if they want Sounds more data. Last thing though, the calendar. I wanted to get your take on the calendar for the NBA because I have some real issues with it. I've been bitching about it forever. I've heard you, 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 Adam Silver just loves getting yeah, yeah, notes I, from you. Yeah, no, he, I don't know if he does. <laughs> um, this is crazy. You have, this is like one of the best four day stretches you can have for the league. And the the free agent signings, all this stuff starts leaking on June 30th on a Friday. Everyone I know has Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, July 4th, Tuesday, Wednesday, basically either five days off or 10 days off or whatever. And yet this is the biggest time for the NBA. And it just seems crazy to me that they don't move everything into June so that it's more eventful. So here's my idea. I would cut down to 76 games which I know you agree with. I'm, I'm, get rid of I'm six in. back-to-backs. I would cut more, but well, I, I, mean, I, get, I get that that's I would love hard. to get the 70, yeah. but 76. So I think we'd all make more money too. So you start, you start the playoffs masters weekend, like April 7th, you rip through it and you're done. Like at the latest June 10th draft is June 17th. I would have a shorter playoff series, which would help as well. I have an idea for that for you yeah. in a second. Uh, Draft like June seventeenth range. Free agency like June twenty fifth. Everybody's locked in. Everybody's still around. Everybody like traffic. Like we know from we had like the two best traffic months we've had at the Ringer, partly because of the NBA. And now it gets to July, and it's like people who don't or places that don't even have cell phone reception or wireless and things like that. But why do they do it this way? Is it, has anybody ever looked at each other and said, this is stupid? We're, no, doing, I, we're, I, we're running one of our biggest this, weeks on July 4th? They talk about the schedule a lot. I would say the, you know, as with everything, it's an accident of uh, uh, of history, right? I mean, yeah. you know, that's why we have 82 games. Like, that's why I think it's funny. It people was decided like, in like 1969. Yeah, people were like, oh, 82 games, it's got to be 82. Like, you know, if they had randomly decided 64, we'd still be playing 64 games. Like it, It's and, so stupid. And, and people are like, no, 82 is perfect. That's why I like tweeted out like seven-minute abs. You know, I got right. six-minute abs. What about five minutes? No, 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 not five. It's got to be – like everyone thinks the number's magic. There's no chance that in 1950-whatever, like someone decided 82 games and that was the perfect number. Like, so, you know, I really think we should think thoughtfully about, you know, how, how many games we play. The great thing about Commissioner Silver is I know, and he's working with the players' union. We're gonna have a shorter preseason. That's a great. That's gonna be awesome. It's a great change. We we need like two preseason games at most. You're not sold on preseason and no. preseason practices. No, it's not. It's not like we're putting in football. No, like, football it's not systems like, here. Like most, a lot of teams are running very similar things. Uh, you know, obviously there's better and worse coaches, but like they, we, we don't need a month to learn the NBA playbook when any diehard fan knows every team's playbook, basically, uh, you know, after watching three games, basically. Yeah. So oh, they're going to run a high screen. Yeah, no. Yeah. Oh, they're they're going to run elbow action. Oh, this the shooter is Shooter in the corner. Yeah. I haven't seen this yet. <laughs> so, you know, high splits, you know, that's never seen that, you know, but, um, so yeah, we can we can do that shorter, spread this, you know, then you know, shorten the schedule, you know, spread the season out more. I hadn't thought of, you know, you think more about the entertainment side of the business. I just think about winning. Yeah. So you make a good point. Like, uh, if if the the big, you know, hot stove portion of the league could happen in June, there there isn't a whole lot going on. We could on see sports. it like when the Markel yeah. Fultz trade happened. And that was like just prime, everybody's locked in. And that was like this three day event. I yeah. mean, I felt yeah. like I had to do a podcast on. No, our trade with the Sunday Clippers like, was like a two or three day little. Although Stephen A was on vacation. So it wasn't okay. that the whole media wasn't totally locked in. All right, a couple more ideas. Five game first round series, but the two top seeds in each can't conference. Can't do that. We had seven. So can't switch to five, Bill. Seven is sacred, even though we just switched. I know, but here, but listen to <laughs> I'm me though. Kidding, I'm kidding, joke. No, I know. Um, five game series, but the top two seeds in each conference get four of the five home games. 
Interesting. Yeah. Just to make the regular season matter more. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Hey, like if you, seven, eight seed, you want to come in great. and beat them? Yeah. You want to yeah. come in and beat them? You got to beat them. Exactly. Got to take some home games off well, their and court. Your playing tournament is awesome. You could do that over two, three days. Add in, add that in. one, I think, just out of pure spite to me, they don't want to do. I, I that's actually been brought up and talked about. I mean, I, I, I mean, never got past any serious point, but the, the, you know, I joke about it all the time, but it's true. Like teams have to take a lot of risks because only one team wins. Yeah, and Europe has this great model where there are these. You know, if you don't win the Champions Cup, you can win the King's Cup, or the, you know, you can win. You know the 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 Euro League. You can win. like there's different things you can win. Yeah, and that that that's good. Like so, even like having like a little tournament before the playoffs or a mid season. You know, you know, little uh, cup among the top teams, something because it's just it's just darn depressing that like literally one team is happy at the end. That's why the NCAA is brilliant. Final four, like people talk like, oh, you made the final four. That's good. They don't talk about, you know, it's great to win the title, but you make the final four. That's cool. Um, I think more randomness in the earlier rounds is. You have to. Because like. I would be one and done. People think I'm crazy. Like, I, I just think. Well, somebody said like 71 out of, I think it was in the last 18 playoffs, 71 of the last 72 seeds were top four. Oh. That made the final. That made the final four. Yeah, they like basically give so, your seed five, six, seven, eight. You have no chance to make round three. Take our game, the NBA, which is an awesome, unbelievable game. I think the best pro game, and the better teams beat the worst teams at a higher rate than any other sport already. Yeah. Baseball, football, soccer doesn't matter. Hockey, the better teams beat the bad teams on a one game basis more than any other sport. We we. We or the Spurs or Golden State beat the bad teams like 85, 95 percent in one game, so, and then we play seven times. <laughs> like, right. We should be the sport that plays once, and the other, you know, like base, baseball playing seven, that makes sense because like it's more random. Like they should play seven game series. We should just play one game and just just see who wins. And the TV attention to a Golden State first round game playing whoever would be huge because like you can win one game you, you they they have a chance everyone knows golden state's going to beat whoever they play the eight seed or the hopefully the seven seed next year they're going to beat them in a seven it's i like, remember remember the rex chapman sons oh yeah so they played the sonics that year with gp yeah and five game series yeah i remember house and i made a big bet on the suns because we they were great odds thought oh, yeah. they had a chance Sean Camp and, uh, and it's like the great thing about those series is if you were up 2-1 you'd game four at home yeah, you know I mean, and you had a real chance to you had a real chance. nowadays if you're up 2-1 the other team's still gonna win yeah the i think did memphis get up 2-1 on golden state like two years ago well but indy went up 2-1 on miami those two yeah. straight years bulls were up 2-0 on boston this year right? yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah everyone knows that uh, it's gonna you know it's gonna even out like i mean it, we have to have a shorter playoff series like it, it so would you do one round or two rounds for shorter i I would do. I would you do, do five games for one, everything. I would be NCAA tournament. Like you would. I would. I know everyone thinks I'm crazy, but we do it in football. It's right. One, like no one thinks it's crazy in football. And the 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 attention and the TV money for one and done. Like they would. Every game would be appointment viewing. Yeah. And the NCAA in sixty three games like makes so much money for the NCAA tournament relative to what we make in like our twelve. 1,250 regular season games and and however many playoff games, I don't have it in my head. Well, fewer this year. But, like, it would generate so much TV money that we'd all benefit. Now, it's a big gamble because it's such a shift from where we're at. That's that's why I don't you'll think it'll happen. Get, yeah, you'll that's never get That's why I don't traction. think it'll happen. It's too real. Like, the NBA is so good the way it is. No, yeah. it's, Like, we'd almost need to go through a crisis like hockey did to get some of these changes and we'd have to make you the the grand pooba commissioner of all sport or well, something. Well the first yeah. the first two rounds need to be fixed. Yeah. They're not competitive enough. Yeah. We don't have upsets and it, they're too predictable and it's not Yeah. you know. Anyway, all right, if you want to hear more with Daryl, we're going to go we're going to take it to the Ringer NBA show. Thank you. Congrats on Chris Paul. Thanks. Appreciate it. I know uh, we couldn't talk too much about how the Chris Paul thing happened. We can talk. Clippers Clippers called us about the trade and we did it. That's the story. That's that's how it happened. Okay, this is great. Yeah, because you weren't you weren't allowed to talk to him until July first. We are not allowed to talk. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Daryl. We'll talk to you in the Ringer NBA show. Uh, we're going to take a quick break to talk about the CreditWise app with a message brought to you by Capital One. An athlete stays in shape by thinking about key factors that influence their game, eating well, practice, training, exercise. Well, it's the same thing if you're trying to keep your credit health in shape, right? There are key factors you have to keep an eye on, and the CreditWise app helps you track all of them. Do you pay your bills on time? How many accounts do you have? How long have your accounts been open? When you keep these key factors in check, you can keep your credit strong and healthy. CreditWise also lets you check your TransUnion credit report anytime you want for signs of error, theft, or fraud. If something looks wrong, the app will tell you what to do next. CreditWise will also send you automatic email alerts when your credit report changes. The best part, it's free for everyone, whether you're a Capital One customer or not. So download the free CreditWise app today and keep your credit strong. Okay, right now we have an interview that I did last week with Jimmy Iovine. He is one of the stars of The Defiant Ones, which is... Daryl, have you seen the, You've heard about The Defiant Ones? Heard about it, but I've been pretty busy, it's so I haven't seen it yet. It's a four-part documentary that's going to be on HBO uh, next week. And it's I think it's available on demand now. And it is about the partnership between Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre. And it's basically tells the story of the last 40 years of oh, music. I've seen the promos and it looks awesome. Man. I got to say, I have a very, very high sniff test for docs, obviously, because of... I've been involved in a lot of them. Since and, you started them at ESPN? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, uh, I thought this was extraordinary. I, I really think this is, if you like music at all, it you have to watch this. It's really good. It's exceptionally well done. Alan Hughes directed it. Uh, it's one of my favorite documentaries that I have seen. And I, when I did this interview with Jimmy, I had not seen the documentary yet. So um, unfortunately we had to kind of talk around that part, but this is a great interview and he's an amazing guy. So here it is, Jimmy Ivy. All right, we're taping this. It's the end of June, but we're going to run it a little closer to the documentary. Great. Uh, Great. Jimmy Ivy is here. HBO is going to, I think July 9th. Yeah. July 9th. A massive documentary project called the defiant ones. Yeah. It's on my relationship with Dr. Dre and sort of how these two guys from, you know, different neighborhoods uh, stay together in some really difficult times and uh, built a business and, you know, and it's kind of, it's, it's fun. It's fun. It's a lot of good lessons in there. I think at least I got some lessons out of it. <laughs> You're from Brooklyn. Yep. He was from Compton. Yeah. Compton. I, didn't, I wanted Red, to make sure I got Red that right. I had to I'm take from Red a break. Brooklyn. He's from Compton. Yeah. And we lived in two, you know, in certain ways, racially charged neighborhoods, you know, and uh, went about our lives. And then we met up in 1990 and it just clicked. And um, he was um, a special guy and we went through a lot and, you know, the whole death row thing and mm. a lot of ups and a lot of really downs and we stayed together and then we created Beats and now we're at Apple. What was the biggest down at death row? Oh, Tupac. Absolutely. That's, 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 Number one, two, and three. Yeah. The movie's out. Are you going to see it? Uh, yeah. No, I'm going to see it. No, I've not seen it, but I'm going to see it. Yeah. I, I haven't seen it. No, no, no. I didn't know where to start with you because there's too many places to go, but I knew I was going to end up at death row at some point. So I wanted okay. to talk about that a little bit. Okay. McEnroe, John McEnroe, ironically, we taped a podcast with him right before you showed up and he was saying, ask him about this time. And he mentioned some, who was the rapper he mentioned, Tommy? Begin with a G. It was a one hit wonder. I don't know. And it it was it was like an early, early rap, like mid eighties, and, uh, and McEnroe was like, I don't know about this. And you were like, No, no, there's something here with rap. I don't know. And you were kind of selling him on it. And he was remember. like, I've always remembered that. He well, was really had, early. We had a lot of conversations about hip hop in the early days. You know, Johnny's a great guitar player, you know, and mm. uh I, at least he'd like me he, he would like me to hear me say that. Um <laughs> but um he he loves to play the guitar and he loves music. You know, he loves Springsteen and all that. You yeah. know, so when hip hop was coming around, he was uh, he was not on he was not on board yet. You know, he, how did you get on board? Because your your Dr. background Dre, was totally different. Very simple. I came out of Rattle and Hum with you too, and uh, we went. I, I started Interscope, and right at Interscope was simple. One of the first things we did, we I met uh, John McClain came in and introduced me to Dre and Suge, and they played me the Chronic, and I didn't know a lot about hip hop. But I knew whoever this was was a great record producer and I wanted to be involved with that person. And 
So we started working together, and the first five years of Interscope and Death Row were really uh, enormously successful, but enormously <laughs> I would say. complex. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? To say the least. Um, all right, so The Chronic. Like, how involved? Are, what are, what notes are you giving? Are you like, hey, maybe take a little easy on easy e here? No, man. Maybe scale it back I, a tiny bit? No, no, no. When I get involved with somebody who's really talented, I just give them the keys and let them drive. I got nothing to but do with it. Those are my favorite bosses. Yeah, we well, got to. Do that. You got to. I mean, uh, if you really know what talent is, if you know the difference, you know, some people need help. Yeah. But some people really don't. As a matter of fact, it works against it. The minute you open your mouth, and um, he's one of those guys. Do you remember when he was telling you about Snoop and this guy needs to be on the album? And No, no, no. He brought me the album completely finished. Oh. Absolutely. They, they put the needle down and went the chronic. <laughs> and um, it was. Um, it was just incredible. It was inc I never heard anything like it. I didn't understand really hip hop that much, but as I'm listening to the words and I'm listening to what's going on, and it was in 19, you know, 91 or whatever it was, and what was going on in LA. Yeah. I said, "Holy shit, these guys got it." You know, these, these guys are nailing what's going on right now and and uh, whenever you can get involved with something like that 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 poetic and that intense, I I was lucky to be involved. So what's interesting about that, and you were living in LA at the time, right? Mm -hmm. And you, and then when you got into music in the seventies or mm -hmm. early seventies, but all through, and the music was kind of, you know, it was capturing so many things that were going on, with young people, America, Vietnam, all these different things. And then you have hip hop in the nineties, the same thing. It's a lot of it's capturing what's going well, it's on. It's captured that vibe. I'm living in Boston. Around. I don't know what's going on in LA. How the hell am I going to know that? You know, cops yeah. are killing people in Compton and stuff like that. Well, I mean, it, it's, uh, they reminded me of the Stones, Snoop and Dre. They had that whole Altamont thing, you know, that yeah. whole energy that the Stones had in the, in the late sixties and early seventies. And I related to it like that. And that's why I knew, you know, I, I said, if we can get this exposed, it's going to be massive. Getting it exposed is the hard part. What was the, how did you get involved with Tupac? Tupac was signed by Tom Wally at Interscope, and uh, you know uh, Tom's office was next to mine. And again, it was uh, we we split up the work, and Tom did a lot of the work on Tupac. And Tupac was an extraordinary person to to, to be in business with. It, but when you lose someone like that on your record company or in general, yeah. you know them. It's a massive loss. He was only twenty five years old, you know, and uh, just it's just shame. It's just. I have no idea why Tupac is dead. Do you feel like, I mean, I think it was five years, all the songs that he had, and then there was other ones that weren't even released and all that. What is, play out his career. What are the next 15 years of his life like if he lives? Because have, the amount of music he produced just in the five years was almost unparalleled. Well, I can't say. I can only say hope because he's a uh, big, and it is the word hope because he... He had two sides of him, and he had a side of him that was really concerned about African American culture and the inner city and stuff. And he would, he was going to be a real voice. You yeah. know, he would have hit his Marvin Gaye stage. You know, if he hadn't yeah. hit it already. And uh, he had a lot to say. And John Lennon, and he's like one of those. So I think anything could have happened. You know, um, I, I mean, the music's all out, so people know what he did. But he only made that music in like three or four months. Right. He recorded like 200 songs or something like that, which is pretty... He was in jail. He came out. Like he, yeah, but he, got he had a ton of studio time. When he got out of jail, time. he went in the studio and just recorded for three or four months. Yeah. Five months, whatever it was, and recorded so much music. But that doesn't account for when he, he would have been older and maybe seen something or, you know, because he, he had a great way of expressing the truth. Was your attitude something's going to happen to this guy? I'm worried. When, this is going row, to the wrong place. Uh, I was worried for all of them. You know, to be honest, I was very nervous about them going to Vegas all the time because I knew there was a lot of heat in Vegas at the time. You know, and I was always concerned for Suge and all the guys that were going there during that. They would go to all the fights. Yeah. And um, but you never, you just don't think that's possible. The East Coast, West Coast thing? What was your, as a detached observer, what was your, as it's, as I, it's kept I escalating? I never, again, I didn't understand, I, I didn't understand it because 
these are people, these are young guys that were making tons of money. They were making tens of millions of dollars a month. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, don't, what, what's this about? You know, what's this about? And uh, it just kept escalating. And you keep thinking that it's okay, that it's going to be old. People are just going to go on and, you know, spend some money and have a good time. But it just kept on escalating to a point of complete ignorance. Yeah. Why do you think Dr. J didn't make more music? Because he, he only puts out what he really loves and he doesn't like a lot. He doesn't do it. He's only put his name on three albums his entire career, you know, yeah. as far as solo records. Put his name on beats. And um, now, now he's doing a television series. He's record, He's made a, a, a television series. For Apple, right? Yeah, he made yeah. it for himself, but uh, but it, it's uh, it's called uh, Vital Sign. It's really good. What's your role as somebody when you're close to an artist like that and... I mean, I would argue that even if he's careful with what he put out, just putting out three albums in 25 years doesn't seem like enough music. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? How but do you how do you, you cajole uh, them? You block and tackle, man. You know what I mean? There was a time where it's in the documentary where, you know, Universal told me to get rid of Dre because we were down like $15 million or something like that because he wasn't putting his music. I didn't put out Detox. And I said, yeah, but I, I'm going with him. If you, want, if you want him to go, I'm going. And because I just knew. I knew he was one of those people that come along every 25 years. Yeah. And um, I still believe it. I don't think he's anywhere near finished. Okay. Would you, would you think of straight out of Compton? I think he nailed it. Hey, um, uh, Gaff, Gary Gray, Cube, Dre, all the actors, they killed it. You know, they really, they got the language right, which is so hard to get in a movie. The script was really, really good. And, the language was real and that's uh that was important that was very important had some great moments too i had ice cube on the podcast a couple weeks ago and we were just you know that movie just doesn't work unless they nail all three actors and what's that unless they nail the three you know they have to nail dre they have to nail cube yeah and they have easy. to nail easy yeah and and i was like I said, I, I said, I was like, well, you lucked out. You went three for three. And he's like, it wasn't totally luck. Like we weren't going to make the movie until we knew we had the three. And, and a Q, lot of movies don't make that mistake. They Dre is not afraid of making anything and not putting it out. No matter the cost, the commitment, what doesn't matter. Yeah. If he doesn't feel it, it could still fail. But if he doesn't feel it, it's not coming out. All right, let's go backwards. So you, you get into the music industry, like the 72, 73 range. Mm -hmm. But you, are you, is it fair to say you were an engineer or yeah. were you more what than that? What I was, was I started out, uh, you know, was in every recording studio in those days, they were, they'd call you a general or, uh, but that doesn't mean that you're the boss It's the opposite. You do general work and you, you get to learn. So there's an engineer and an assistant and a producer in the room and you get to watch them and help them. Yeah. And then eventually you graduate to a uh, second engineer. And uh, so what happened was, which is, in, is actually in the documentary as well, is I, I used to do everything around the studio, clean it up, set it up, get microphones, you know. So one day my boss, his name was Roy Sakala, who owned the studio, uh, and um, his client was John Lennon. And they called me up on Easter Sunday and they said, we need you to come in and answer the phone. So I'm Catholic and I live in Brooklyn and I'm Italian. And so I said, absolutely. Because I felt, I was so insecure that I felt, I got to work harder than the next guy for me to get anywhere, for me to be useful to any of these people. What do they, they don't need me for anything. Yeah. So I went to my mother. I said, mom, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to work. She goes, no, you're not. Your suit's upstairs. Church is in an hour. And your whole family's coming over here. I said, mom, I'm going to work. Right. So I left and I got to the studio and I walked in and, and, and John Lennon and Roy Sakala are laughing. And they said, well, you know, uh, our assistant engineer just left and we wanted to see if you how much you wanted it. So we want you to become the third piece of this thing. Mm. And it was, a, you know, that was the beginning of my career. Easter Sunday, uh, 1973. Who's your role model at that point? What it, like you, you obviously want to get in the music industry. Do you even have somebody you're pointing no. to and saying, "I want to be like that guy"? No. Well, I yeah, I liked 
I like music. I liked Phil Spector's music, but I didn't want to be like him. Right, you're a crazy uh, person. You know, uh, no, there was nothing, man. I, I, I didn't know anybody. I mean, I knew my father. You know, but your I, dad I, said you had like just an unbelievable ear for music like the whole time. Like there was well, something different about how you heard things. I think, you know, I, I, I turned out when I got into the studio, I was finally natural at something. And yeah. I finally wasn't afraid of something. Because what happened was when I used to play sports when I was a kid, I was the guy that was like, please don't hit it to me. Right. You know, you, you got the uniforms on, you're out there. And you're <laughs> yeah. like, okay, hit it to anybody else. Yeah. And, um, and it was the obvious thing. When I got into the studio and I started doing my first mixing, like I mixed a song called Sweet Little 616 for John Lennon on the Rock and Roll album, I was like, hit the ball to me. And just mm. it, my, I, what happened was I said in the, in, in the documentary, the thing that seems to be landing with young people is at a certain point, we all have fear and it's a gigantic headwind. But at a certain point, if you can flip it and make it a tailwind, it's got massive energy, massive energy. And you can really get you through a lot. And that's what happened to me on, on John's album is when I first, in retrospect, when I first realized that that feeling became something that was pushing me forward and into things rather than holding me back. Mm. That's pretty cool. Why did young people respond to that? Young people don't respond to anything. Of course, because they that's all they responded to. They that's feel great. they they want they think that's a mad. They said, "Wow, how'd you do that?" Because I I'm frozen. <laughs> yeah, I'm frozen. Expectations. Well, they're frozen because they're staring all, at their yeah, phone. Well, how could you not? Well, th th by the way, Instagram. If I was a kid in Brooklyn and I saw all these people on Instagram having the greatest time, having the greatest girls, doing the greatest things, the greatest clothes, I'd be frozen. Yeah. I'm like, how can my life compare to that? So I go make up some bullshit and say, okay, let's go make my life look interesting. You know, I mean, I don't know how people aren't frozen today. I don't know how they do it. It's, it's, it, every kid I walk over to has anxiety and depression. I said, I, I understand. How could you not have anxiety or depression when everybody you see on Instagram, et cetera, is having the greatest life in the world? Right. You, you know, That's a you, good point. you know what I mean? It's like, oh shit. <laughs> you know, uh, so that's what they were relating to. They were relating to how do I get this monster out from in front of me? Did you catch John Lennon at a good time in his career? I caught John at a very volatile time in his career. He yeah, it was seventy three to seventy late seventy five. Yeah, so I was gonna was say whole, it was had some issues going on. It was right? a long weekend. Yeah. It was L I came to L A with him. I did three albums with him. Yeah, and um, it was a tough time for him. But he, oh, it was also when he was going to court. Uh, being um, trying to get thrown out. Uh, Nixon was trying to take his green card away. Yeah. Don't try to take his visa away. Uh, I'm not sure if he had a green card yet, but um, he was going to court every day and coming to the studio after that during Walls and Bridges. And I saw him every day. And that was the first time I realized, whoa, the government isn't always do the right thing. I didn't, you know, I didn't know. I was a Catholic kid from Brooklyn, right. grew up, and my dad was a longshoreman. My, we, we were supposed to respect the government, respect church, everything. And now all of a sudden, this guy that I know is really the truth. Richard Nixon's trying to throw him out of the country because of what he's saying. And I was like, that was the first time I started to go, oh, because I was 19. I was saying, oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it was like, really, maybe, maybe it was late, but it was the first time it hit me. I can't imagine what it would be like to have a president that would act irrationally like that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> what are you Tell do, me more. Right? It's uh, <laughs> what was know, that like? That was exactly right. Uh, let's I guess, stay away from that way, one. Yeah. So um, I'm a Springsteen guy. I think there's two people in this world. There's Spr Springsteen guys, and then everybody else. That's right. Um, I don't know. I'm in my 40s, so I don't. I don't know how he resonates with like people under. Tate, do you care about Springsteen? I mean, yeah. Tommy. Yeah. Okay. I never know with these things, but, uh, you know, Born to Run, which I would still put on the short list of the all-time great albums. It's an incredible album. And it just sounds like he was a maniac making it. I mean, he, at one point, he almost gave up on it. He was going to do it live. Like, he was yeah. the ultimate torture genius. He seems like a lot more mellow now than he was in 1975. Well, he hides it better. No, I... Um, he hides it better. I'm kidding. Okay. I'm kidding. He... Um, I learned my work ethic from Bruce Springsteen. I grew up, you know, um, thinking you had a job. And, you know, you finish your job. 
Bruce has never finished. See, John was like a Beatle, like so they used to record fast. Yeah. The Beatles always recorded fast as they made all those albums. So John's thing was like, I'm done in 10 hours, eight hours. You know what I mean? Right. Bruce is never done. So it was like the first time I realized that you just stay in a state of pain until the music's right. And I learned that from him and it was an amazing gift. At the time it felt really painful, but uh, I learned a I learned I learned my work ethic from Bruce Springsteen. Did you ever worry that he wasn't going to release the album? Oh, well, there's a fabulous story that I'm not sure if I made the movie or not, but what happened was we, we finished Born to Run. One day we were doing Born to Run and Bruce was like, no drugs, you know? So all we had to stay He was away. drunk on life. He was <laughs> drunk, on, drunk on intensity. He was drunk in the yeah, energy. Yeah, and... So I'm there and we're mixing the album and it's like we had eight songs. So we had nine days to mix them because he didn't have any money. No, none of us had any money, you know, so we had to go on, he had to go play a gig. So we're mixing the album after all that time. And I'm like, so like I'm exhausted and we're mixing She's the One. And I'm up to like, it's like two days now where maybe I fell asleep on like a couch outside for a minute, but it was like, you know, coffee and tea and everything you could possibly imagine soda anything with caffeine in it to stay awake i even tried those trucking pills once and <laughs> which i hated and um so we i i go to look at my assistant and i said what are you what are you chewing he said it's it's, it's it's spearmint i said give me that thing so i took the spearmint gum and i took the gum and i threw it in the garbage and i chewed the aluminum foil I don't know if you've ever done that on a cavity. Oh my God. It woke me up. It it was it was like electric shock. And I mixed the record while chewing it. And it was so painful. So <laughs> we finished the album. Now I have to master it, right? And and if you look at any photos of me that day, I was uh it was unbelievable. So now he's playing a gig in um he's playing a gig out in um I think it was Boston or something. I had to take a train. I had to take a five-hour train ride. So I mastered the album. I get it. It's on. It's on lacquer, and I bring it out to him to play to him. So he doesn't have a record player on the road. So we go to a record store that no one knows. We don't know what the speakers sound like. We don't know anything, but we also don't know what we're doing. So we go in the record store. He hears it, and he. You know, he's, um, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So we head back to his hotel. It was one of those motel kind of places. And his room was right outside the pool. He took the, he took the lacquer and just threw it in the pool. And oh said, my God. we're doing this over again. And I, my friend that I took from my old neighborhood had a bunch of Valium with him and I took it in order to get home. <laughs> I just said, give me that shit. <laughs> and um, I got on the train and it was just, thank God for John Landau because he uh, saved the day and the album finally came out. That was always strange to me that somebody who wrote about Bruce Springsteen ended up becoming his manager and confidant. He really understood him. I don't even know what him. the equivalent of that would be now. I don't know, it's pretty but he rare. really understood him. He, and he was a great producer, Landau. Yeah. Landau was a terrific record producer and um, just had an understanding of music that intellectually Bruce really connected with and a love for it. And uh, he was a great resource for Bruce Springsteen. And you did all the Springsteen albums all the way through Tunnel no, of Love? Or you did, no. When did you go I off? did two albums. I did Darkness and... I did Born and Run in Darkness because I really... There was no space for me on their production team, so I wanted to produce records. So I I went from darkness into Patty Smith. Gotcha. And I did Easter with her. But so you weren't involved at all with Springsteen after that? If not only as friends. Uh -huh. I, only did, I only did those two albums because I was an engineer and I I started producing. I did. I went from Patty. Then I went into Tom Petty. I did uh, Damn the Torpedoes with Tom Petty. Right. And you were responsible for the Patty. Do you? For because the night, yeah, because the yeah, night yeah. was on darkness. It was going to be on darkness. I like. I know you've told that story a million times, but I like your description of it. How it just felt like it well, would have resonated more if a girl sang the song. Yeah, it's just very simple, you know. You know, 
take me baby here as I am. I, I just felt if a guy hears a woman sing these song lyrics, it can't miss, <laughs> right. you know? And, um, it, um, I was right. <laughs> and uh, Bruce uh, wasn't going to use it on his album, so I just knew. And then Patty finished the verse and just took off from that aggressive that theme, it. you know, and she, you know, she sings, uh, you know, desire is hunger is the fire I breathe, love is a banquet on which we feed, which was a kind of a very similar kind of vibe where Bruce was going. And it was my first hit record as a record producer, so it changed my life. Yeah. Let's take a quick break to talk about Miller Lite. Miller Lite is brewed to not only taste great, but also be less filling. It only has 96 calories. So it won't fill you up. It's brewed to be enjoyed from tip off to the final buzzer. It's the original light beer and has been since they first showed up courtside in 1975. I have a special affection for Miller Lite for two reasons. One, because it's been my favorite beer since the late 1980s. Ask anyone I went to college with. And also... They made great NBA ads and did NBA posters and used a lot of the old Celtics, which was really a way to win my heart in the in the uh, 1980s. I love Miller Lite. Check it out. Miller Lite. Next time, next time you're buying beer, next time you're going to drink responsibly, go ahead, do it. Miller Lite. Back to Jimmy Ivey. Did you think in 1975 Springsteen was going to become the biggest white music music star in the world man because it happened nine years later in 1975 i didn't think there was going to be 1976 right you know uh, i had no idea i i knew that when it came out that it was big and i wasn't you know i didn't I, i'd never been involved myself with something that, that was that big and new from something really not a lot of people knew about so it was an incredible feeling and the shows were so incredible yeah. I, used to go, I used to go record the shows as oh my well god in the like truck. four and a half hours all those great bootlegs out i recorded you know cw post and live in uh, cleveland oh, the hammersmith the, one the uh, I, didn't do, I didn't do england i okay. didn't go to, i didn't go to europe but i did everyone in america the roxy yeah. bottom line and it's just four four and a half hours every night no not in those days those days it was two two and a half hours I wonder what I wonder at the first the second concert I ever saw was Springsteen like 1980 and he just kept doing encores and like people he like wore the audience out people were ready to leave he was oh, like oh, I'm know, coming back again I got Here's to ask that about him I, asked that, I got to ask him about that recently because we are uh, my wife and I went to um, Italy to watch him play and we stayed with him uh, in Italy and next morning he did a four and a half hour show. I just got off a plane. And, and next morning, we got up, we were having breakfast. I said, and I, we're talking about exercise. And he says, you know, I, I said, because he's really. He's in amazing shape. Yeah, he's in amazing shape. So I'm, I'm always talking to him about, I don't have the discipline he does. But I never had the discipline he does. He drives me nuts with this, that discipline thing because he's so incredible at it. But I said to him, why four and a half? So I said, what about this exercise? He goes, look, Jimmy, just don't do anything to hurt yourself. So I looked at myself, what about four and a half hours at 67 years old? You know, he says, well, you know, I can't help that. He says, once the audience gets going, he just loves I'm going to take them on. You know what I mean? He goes, and we're going to go toe to toe. And he just, by the way, he doesn't even have a set list. He has a set list, but he completely throws it away. Yeah. And he calls the songs one after the other. It's, I mean, if anyone has a chance to see Bruce Springsteen, they should go see it. Yeah. Well, what's cool about like him from 71 to 75, basically, you know, when you hear some of those live, the things, cause he would always tell the stories, which I always love. Yeah. Like, when I was growing up yeah, and he yeah, tells yeah, his yeah, whole yeah. things and there's like, you can feel like he knows he has the potential and the people around him know, and you can hear the crowd screaming and like people clearly knew in Jersey, this guy's yeah. a comet that's passing through us and it's going to become something way more well, what special. what happened with Born to Run was it started to just take over everywhere. And then all yeah. of a sudden, because then he But he didn't it. want that though, I don't think, right? Wasn't he a little afraid of massive success like that? Well, he was, free, he was afraid of the way they promoted it. With the time and Newsweek thing freaked him out. And then he went to England and it said, the future of rock and roll, they used John's quote. It was on all right. the post. He actually went around and ripped them all down. And, yeah. You know, he was... Uh, He's an incredible person. <laughs> he yeah. just is, you know, and I, I, I still, I'll say it again. I don't have anything to do with his live tours, but if anybody has a minute yeah, and take your kids so they get inspired like that, because that's, that's what work looks like. And, and you caught incredible. Tom Petty pretty young. 
I did. I, I, Tom Petty. I, I, I. That was after Patty Smith. Yeah. You know, he heard that album, and they asked me to get involved in their record, and you know, I was lucky. It was the same exact thing. Bruce had two albums, and the second one didn't do as well as the one before it, and so did Tom. So I went in on their third album. So I applied all the principles of Springsteen as far as my work was concerned. What are the principles? Just that to, you have to just really make everything about that third album and those, you know, has to be better than that second album. Just that much better. So you think the third album's the, the key album? In those days, yeah. when you're making records like that now, I don't know what's the third album, the first album. It, 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 so many things are confusing right <laughs> yeah. now. But, but in those days, it was you built it because there wasn't, you know, SoundCloud. You just built it and had to sell every song door to door. You yeah. got a hit on the radio, but... So the third album, if you got to make a third album, that means you've been touring now for three or four years. And the, and at a certain point, you've got to pull out. You've got to go for the lead. You yeah. know what I mean? And that's the time around the third album. I just had a conversation with Kendrick Lamar, Kendrick Lamar at my house about that before when he's making this album. That's a great name drop. I'm, I'm really like... What? No, it's just great. I've I've always wanted to do a podcast with somebody who said I just had a conversation with Kendrick Lamar. I'm on the edge of my seat now. Well, Dre Dre signed him to yeah, I know. to Aftermath, right? So he was at my house and he was doing something with us, and he um, I said to him, you know, you're on your third because he was on Interscope. Yeah, right. So now I'm not at Interscope anymore, but I still I still him and Top Dog are fantastic. So I said I said Kendrick, you're on your third album. First of all. Don't make it on the road like everybody's doing their records right now. Take time off and make it because it's the most important album you're going to make in your young life, mm. in, in, in your 20s and 30s. Because you get this right, you'll go rather than if you just, if it just, if it's just okay. And uh, he wrote me a note saying that uh, he really appreciated that because it inspired him. But he's, he's one of So the you're saying take like, three months off no. four no how, how much with, time what's, what's wrong with the music business right now is that artists are convinced that there's no money in recording so they spend all their time on the road yeah so doing shows that means they're not making records so they're spending less time in the studio less time in the studio is going to possibly make inferior records yeah so you think his now that you gave him that advice this next one, if he listens to it, this next one will be the one. No, his third album. He, that's this album out right now. Oh, you gave? I thought you gave him that advice recently. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, I'm I'm with you now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No. So I, did he thank you in the liner notes? Oh, he was so sweet. No, no, no. But he wrote me a note. <laughs> did they have sure, liner I'm notes sure anymore? The, I'm, I'm not sure the the no how much it influenced him, but he got it. He got it, and because people don't think like that now. They yeah. just drop singles and run around. You know, it's uh, it's it's tough. It's tough for artists right it now. It was the rare album that actually felt like an album in 2017 like there, it, there was I'm a talking. coherence to it that's and there what I'm were saying. the titles look cool all you know how that, yeah. that adele ed sheeran and kendrick yeah. people that drake people that take the time off and make the records hmm. you can't make the records because somebody in dubai wants to pay you half a million dollars so you go to dubai right leave the studio and go make a record you know, and uh, and not make your record. So I, that's what uh, I think. That's one of the things the record industry is suffering from right now. People are not putting time into the records that they should. You almost can't even call it a record industry anymore. It's like a song industry. Yeah, it's or a song factory. I want. I want to know what all is going on in the world right now. Where's Where's Marvin Gaye? Where's I, Stevie I swear Wonder? to God, I was going to yeah. ask you this, like. Because we talked earlier about the 70s and how the music that came out of all these different things that were going on. Then you saw it again in the 90s. Why isn't that happening yet I in don't know. 2016, I 17? I waiting. Kendrick, Kendrick <laughs> tapped the guy, into it. Absolutely. There's a few people, but Kendrick has it all. Kendrick has the music, the lyric, the attitude, the idea, the inspiration. Kendrick's got it. Kendrick has that thing, you know, that Patti Smith had. You know, Who, who else do you think had that? Oh, I mean, that you worked with. John is Lennon, it a short list or is Bono it a. Bono had it, John Lennon had it, Bruce Springsteen had it. You know, I was, uh, I've been fortunate to be involved with a lot of people that saw music in a way to, to move, to move the needle both socially and popular culture and, you know, saw, read the world and 
repeated it and, and, and spoke for it, you know. But naturally, the greatest of all time is Bob Dylan, you know. But Wow, you're giving him the GOAT title. Oh, yeah. That's, that's easy. Really? Yeah. And, and, and great, I, I, I'll, I'll give you another one. The greatest rhetoric executive of all time, Barry Gordy. Simple. When Barry Gordy was making records, his artists weren't allowed off the bus down south. And this guy made, crossed over and right. made pop music, made urban music acceptable in pop music and took it over. What he did was a miracle. And those records are one better than the other. None of us after him had that. Yeah. <laughs> had to deal with that. And you did, you worked with Stevie Nicks. Yeah, I did Belladonna. Who, according to my internet research, you also dated. Yeah, I did. We did. <laughs> For the making of the album. I was, how, long, how long did that relationship last? Well, I was completely a, a social cripple. And so I had no idea. I had no idea how to do anything socially. So I went out there, immediately recorded the record. And we, she moved into my house. And we made the album. And then she was like the iconic rock babe of the late the 70s, time, early no, no, no. 80s. I, I, was, I know you realized that as it was happening. I, I was so focused on not getting the work right yeah. and having a bomb album that I didn't, we never went anywhere. Yeah, because that was a weird era, right? Where people didn't even feel like if a woman was in a band, they shouldn't spin off and have their own album. And That's exactly what yeah. happened. Fleetwood Mac did not want her to have her own album. Yeah. Well, why would they want her to become more famous? That's, right. That means she's so, just going to leave the band. And the same thing happened on that album with Tom Petty and Stop Dragging My Heart Around. That was Tom's song. I just did the same oh, trick. Oh, now I, I... Yeah. Did the same trick twice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Fleetwood Mac, I've always been obsessed with... I know you weren't involved with Rumors, but I still think that's the most interesting album that's ever come I, out just because of all the weird relationships that were involved. Uh, that's the only thing. I, one, that's one of those albums like Born to Run that would make an incredible stage play. Yeah, yeah you're you right. Know, Could rumors. you have the behind the scenes stuff in it? Excuse me? I mean, everyone's dating everybody and then they I make would, all the songs yeah, well, are about well, the well, failed what, relationships. That's the play, yeah. That's what the play would be, right? <laughs> so you would, have, you would have scenes, songs, and then scenes of the... I don't oh, know. That'd be interesting. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't. I'm not doing it, but somebody should. That's a good idea. Yeah. And then you did uh, you two under, under the blood red sky. I under blood red sky, which and, and I, I that's wore right, into that, the ground on my eight. Was eight track back in '83? What was it? Was yeah, the eight track right? Yeah, there was some eight tracks involved in that. And um, what happened was, I was down in the dumps, and I was I started to become a producer. that was producing established artists and I couldn't get any young artists because the label I was too expensive or whatever the labels yeah they, they thought I had I'd have too much influence or you know oh. so I was working with Bob Seeger and Stevie Nicks who were great and Dire Straits who were great but I wanted a new artist and my ex-wife called me was at the Us Festival actually she was working for Westwood One and she was covering it and she goes there's a guy down here you got to see and I flew down and I saw you too playing so it's like 1982 the Us Festival. Yeah. And I followed them to Ireland and I tortured oh, wow. them until they worked with us. I, I mean, mean, that was like a, a great era to torture you too. It was. Then I did Rattle and Hum with them um, five years later. I was going to ask you about that because I was in college when that came out. And coming off the Joshua Tree, that was about as anticipated of a next album. Yeah, so they kind of took a left turn. Than I can remember. It was smart what they did. They took a left turn. You know, they went to um, they went to live sort of studio album combined. And, yeah. Um, smart what they did because you look back on that album. That album is actually a great. Album. Oh, it's loaded. That it was weird. We were, people were like weirdly a tinge disappointed with it when it That's came right. out. That's right. Because they couldn't win with whatever right. they released. That's right. But you go back and listen now. That desire is an incredible Angel of Harlem. Oh yeah. We went all over the country to record that album. You know, there's a really good documentary about them that not a lot of people have seen about the couple years after they made that album when they almost broke up and then they ended up going to Germany and it was kind of that yeah. fork in the road moment that a lot of bands have. Yeah, that was- Where they've uh, had some success and it's either going to well, keep going after, or it's going to That end. was after Rattling Home. Yeah. Look, I stopped producing records after that. I started Interscope. That's how hard that record was to make. That's how hard Rattling Home was? Yeah, it was brutal. It just it finished you? For me, yeah. Yeah. 
they, as Bono would say, they, and he says it in the documentary, he says, well, we broke them. <laughs> I couldn't do it. I, I just, I, I just, I said, I'm done. I when it's hard, is it because the group's fighting with each other? Is it because they're being perfectionists? What makes it hard? You can't get what you want. You can't get what you want, then you won't settle for something that, unless it's what you want. And Bono and the band are really like that. And to a certain extent, I'm like that. But as the producer, it's all going through you. All the energy's going through you. The music's going through you. So you, you know, you're getting hit with all of it. And that album, I was, at that moment, I was producing records for about 15 years already. And I just said, you know what? Then I heard them talking and saying, they didn't ask me to do the follow-up album. Yeah. But I think it was Octoon Baby. Octoon Baby is the next and, one. And uh, I heard them saying they were going to go to Berlin to record it. I said, I'm not going to Berlin. <laughs> You're like, I'm out. Good luck, guys. I am, they didn't ask me, but I said, even if they asked me, I'm not going to Berlin. So I started a record company, <laughs> and it was Interscope. So that kind of worked out. So <laughs> When you start a record company, what happens? Do you need... Did you do it with your own money? Did no, you have no, a no. partner? Field, How'd you do it? Ted, my partner, Ted Field, put the money up. I brought yeah. some money in from Atlantic Records with that. I was getting a deal with, so we brought that money together. And um, Tom Wally and John McClain were working for Ted. And we started Interscope. And it just there was something about the combination of the people that just caught fire. And, that and was it became it. like it was one thing after the other. It just kept working, you know? How much of it was being shrewd and how much of it was luck? You know, I, I think that, uh, I, I got to be honest with you, we had, there were some talented people at Interscope. Yeah. John McClain's an extraordinarily talented person uh, that found, the found Dr. Dre for us, brought him in. Tom Wally, who discovered Tupac, really talented. And Ted was very talented. So I'd have to say that uh, the Interscope people was a really good team. Probably a different, different element of characters, with Interscope, like some unsavory characters, like we talked about earlier, like some of the people that they ran around with, like did did you ever think, you know, not no. that your life was in danger, but like, well, yeah. did you ever think no, no, like, I, oh I, shit, I, I'm worried, I'm a little there, worried about myself here. There were times where it was scary, you know, because it's not just the guys, it's the guys. The hanger on guys. All the guys yeah. that are trying to get to the guys. You yeah. know what I mean? And then all of a sudden East Coast, West Coast breaks out and you got a mess and uh, you know, it's music, but at that time, I don't think there's ever been anything like that in the history of the music business. And this no. documentary covers it like crazy. It mm. really, um, it shows that whole thing and that era in episode three really powerfully. And it, the director did a good job because it was, it was scary. It was dangerous. It was great. It was awesome. And there were certain things that were horrible. So like a lot of, and then we had Marilyn Manson and Trent Reznor at the same time as right. well. So we had, we had it from both sides. And then Time Warner, that's when they, uh, the government came out against us and Time Warner, um, we were able to get out of our, our deal and move over to Universal because they didn't want to put the music out. How did you get involved with Geffen? Geffen's just been a friend. John Landau, Springsteen, introduced me to Geffen, and he's been um, an older brother. And actually, David taught me everything I know about business, Geffen taught me. So you're still good with Geffen? Oh, yeah, Because yeah. people are either all in or all out on him with I'm no in between. I'm all in all the time, always, forever. We've <laughs> never, I've never thought about it. He's the greatest, man. He smart as anything. He still is. And he taught me, really, the art of business, you know, because it's an art form. If you the really good guys, give me like two them. tips. Um, Bank of America, no. <laughs> uh, it's just, like two uh, two good lessons from him. Well, you know, um, it's funny. Um, he, he he he. There's a lot. Like for example, when I was going through that whole thing at Time Warner, and I I thought we were going to get thrown out, he looked at me very calmly and said, "You are not that lucky." Because he knew what they were doing was bullshit. Yeah. Based on lyrics, it was a it was a red herring. It was nonsense. Yeah. So he kind of calmed me down. I said, "Wait, getting out's a good thing. Okay, let me get out because then you still got the company." Yeah. So, um, but he's always there on stuff like that. Always chessboard you know, stuff. Clear, just the shortest distance between any two spaces is David Geffen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and. Um, 
he's an awesome guy in this area. So you and you and Dre you do beats. Beats takes off. Mm -hmm. Then eventually you, you, like many other people, saw the potential of a streaming company. You start that, and then Apple eventually buys everything. Yeah. And now you're still in charge of Apple Music, yeah, right? I'm in charge of Apple Music uh, with, with with a bunch of people, and um, so what? Like, what's your inner circle? How many people are actually running this thing? Apple Music. Well, yeah. there's probably you know four or five people that are doing it together, the senior people. But then there's a lot of people that work there naturally, and we have um, we're trying to build we're trying to build something with elegance. We're trying to build a relation between the audience and the artist that bring some elegance to it because the competition is free music and it's uh you have to you have to bring something to the party the service has to be of service yeah has to be reason to grab you in to say okay it's helping me if we're not helping you why are you going to sign up when you can just go get the music for free what's the what's the best criticism that has been levied about apple music in the last two years well in the early days the, the ui was very complicated and it's not anymore that's you know that was um that was true, uh, and uh, we fixed it. That thing was that. That's that's one of them, and uh, that was the main one. The UI was just not right. Do you feel like there has to be a winner in this streaming thing, no. or can ten people be doing it no. at the same time? No, streaming has to be a winner. We're not sure about that yet. Okay, there's only a hundred million people on streaming. Of course, there's a free tier. The fight, the streaming's issue. Now, it is so worth $10 a month to get all the music in the world. And if you use it, there's so much depth in there. We have things like, I just go in and I, I we have a whole um, radio segment, right? Where I just patch in my favorite Bob Dylan song and it plays me a different radio station every day that is so awesome. Because we also have human curators where we make the list, we have people to make the list personally. Yeah. You know? And um, so Apple Music is very, very, very musical. And um, so it's worth it, but it's hard to explain to people that, you know, music is, if it's free, why am I paying for it? Well, you're selling it to at least the under 30 generation, like these two guys over here, they're used to not paying for stuff. That's right. And being able to That's right. cut corners and sneak around and get through this or go in this yeah. link and now you're getting it That's anyway. why you have to be of service. You have to be great. You have to hook them through... So you're trying you know, to do it through like DJs, no, no, through no. different channels, no, so through go, curation. Like we have a thing on the service called For You, which every day when you wake up, there's new music for you. Like for example, they just- they I've just, seen that. I've always ignored it on my, oh, on no, my man, Apple. I'll play you mine from today. I'll play you mine from today. And um, here's mine from today. Do you ever play music on here? On what? On the radio, on your podcast? Um, no, we can't. Can. Right we can't now. Look, look, here's here's what this is crazy. This this is what it served me today. Stevie what Nicks. It, no. Oh. What it thinks that I'm gonna like. Huh. Apple Music. So here it starts with this. Springsteen. Right. Then it goes to this. Ramones. I'm gonna be oh, sedated. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Then it goes to this. Then it goes to this. So that knows you really well. Then it goes to this. <laughs> and then it goes to this. Wow. Okay. That and thing then, knows you. And it keeps going. So I'm saying it knows me. And that is what we're really working on. Make your life easier and give you like that playlist. I know tomorrow morning I will be swimming with this playlist. Yeah. You know? Can you win and Spotify can win at the same time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if streaming wins, we all win. There's plenty of room, man. There's plenty of room. I think streaming's going to win. The thing I can't figure out is the subscription stuff. and That's what I'm calling streaming. Because we're seeing in the digital no, media. streaming is one. Subscription's yeah, yeah, yeah. got to win. That's, I, I phrased it wrong. Because we're seeing it with... Uh, you know, digital media and yeah, you're yeah, seeing yeah. now newspapers like the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post no, and all, New York. Streaming is one. They figured it out. It's will subscription music win. And I, I, you know, I'm hopeful. What would be the biggest obstacle to it winning? Other free. than young people. Free. The labels have licensed their music for free. Where do you see podcasts fitting into this whole thing? Uh, podcasts, we are starting to do them on Apple Music, you know, and I think podcasts are really interesting and great ways uh, to learn things and understand and 
you know, on demand stuff is fantastic. So we're very bullish on podcasts at Apple. Okay. So you, you, they control like 70% of them basically. Like I think for most people's downloads, I know with ours, it's definitely like probably 70% get them through iTunes. Oh yeah. Well, and we're, we're bullish on them, you know, we're going we're gonna to take it a little more serious as well. Once we get there's so much to do. Though. So all these great people you worked with, is there a common, common thread with what made them great? When you think about like Springsteen and Dre and John Lennon and Bono, is there, is the there lack something? Of the lack of compromise. Lack, lack of, of compromise. compromise. Yeah. They will not compromise. That's it. Period. You couldn't buy rent Bruce Springsteen. You can there's nothing you there's nothing that you have that he wants. <laughs> and that's the most frightening thing in the world. So this documentary is July 9th. HBO. HBO. Four parts. Like four days in a row? How yeah, are they doing? Four days it? in a row. Four days in a row. Yeah. This is great because there's never anything on in July. July is like when Hopefully, when sports uh, dies except for baseball and all this, all you know. Yeah, I mean, there's very rarely anything I think, going on. I think it's 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 meant to inspire, you know, and it's it's very truthful. What's the most embarrassing thing you can say about Eddie Q in this podcast? Because he might be listening. I've known him for a while, so you could be mean if you want. Eddie Q, there's there's a I means a lot of embarrassing things like that. No, <laughs> <laughs> he's um. He's a beast, you know. He, he's a. Uh, I live down near him in Cabo as well, you know, and I work with him all the time. And he's like, he's in your face. He's just a guy that just tells you the way he hears and feels it. You know what I mean? He's a beast of a guy and a great guy. And, and, and it could, yeah, guy from Silicon Valley. He's really, he's he's a lot like a content guy. He he breathes and he feels like a very creative, you know, artistic person because he has a great feel for what you're doing. And, you know, he's a sports fanatic, you know, and I find him to be, uh, uh, I'm very lucky that he's the guy that bought our company. So what do the next five years look for you? Look like for you? Oh man, I'm 64 years old, man. You know what I'm saying? I, I just want them to be there right now. <laughs> 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 that's what they look like <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy thank you that was thank fun thank you man alright alright all right. All right. thanks so much to Jimmy Ivey and thanks so much to Daryl Morey don't forget we're going to run something else with him on the Ringer NBA show so look out for that thanks to CreditWise from Capital One remember the CreditWise app helps you track the key factors that keep your credit health in shape with CreditWise you can check your TransUnion credit report at any time for signs of error theft or fraud the app will also send automatic email alerts when your credit report changes. Download the free CreditWise app today. And don't forget House of Carbs, Joe House's new food podcast, which is going to be absolutely extraordinary. It's launching this week. Nephew, when are we launching it? Like, could be tonight, tomorrow? Could be late tonight, tomorrow. Yeah. Could be late tonight. Could be dropping after you hear this podcast. Could be tonight. Could be July 4th. Fireworks coming out of your belly. Um, House of Carbs, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, SoundCloud, wherever you listen to them. Very excited for this podcast. And also, since we're talking about podcasts, Cousin Sal's Against All Odds, the podcast this week, the July 4th one, we interviewed Matt Stoney, the degenerate trifecta and Cousin Sal. They do the, uh, they went to the Captain Morgan's Make Believe Casino. And tried to figure out who would win a fight on July 4th between Mr. Miyagi and Rambo. And it's one of the great five minutes in podcast history. It's really spectacular. Rambo was a minus 750 favorite. And I would just say that three of the four people went with the underdog. The reasons were spectacular. I was very jealous. I'm very jealous of the Make Believe Casino in general. It's a great idea. I might just steal it. I might just start doing them uh, for my podcast too. Anyway, check that out. Enjoy uh, July 4th. Be responsible with fireworks. Watch your kids around the fireworks and uh, and don't eat too much. Be back on Wednesday with a full free agency recap. Hopefully Gordon Hayward has picked the team right by then. That's it for the BS Podcast. <laughs> <laughs>